grew up in Germany, hiking uh, in the Bavarian and Austrian Alps. Um, her mother instilled a love of hiking and the outdoors in her. So uh, with that very interesting background, unusual, uh, take it away, Christina. All right, okay, let me I hit share screen here and uh, let's see, there we go, share. All right, everybody, thanks for joining us tonight. I hope you uh, get some interesting and useful information out of my presentation tonight. So uh, as Julianne mentioned, uh, my uh, presentation tonight is on local desert hikes and desert hiking safety. Uh, basically, I'll be covering some hikes in the uh, Greater Palm Springs area. So did, can everyone see my uh, PowerPoint? You guys see the PowerPoint? Yes. Yes. Oh, okay. All yeah. right. Want to make sure. All right. Before we get started. Okay. So the first thing I want to talk about before we even get out on the hikes is the 10 essentials. So um, the 10 essentials, um, I got this information uh, from a uh, Dallas area Sierra Club um, outings leader. And uh, anyway, what you do need uh, to have as part of your 10 essentials is the navigation essentials, which would be a map of the area. So where you are, the trail maps, um, stuff like that. Also a compass in case you do get off trail by any chance or that you can uh, help orientate yourself to which way to go. Now, you do need to kind of learn to use the compass um, if you're out there. So we're talking more wilderness. I'm more a day hike person, but there are plenty of people who've gone out on day hikes that have gotten lost and had to be rescued. So, um, but anyway, um, if you want to learn how to do map and compass and you're interested in hiking, you could always try and become a volunteer hike leader with the Sierra Club, like I did, because uh, that's one of the things you have to learn to become a certified hike leader with the Sierra Club is the map and compass class. So anyway, I just thought I'd throw that out there. Um, the other thing is a whistle. Um, you should have a whistle on your person because if you do get lost, uh, three blasts is a universal emergency signal if you get um, out there. And also one is uh, just uh, um, one blast also can call out to someone that there may be trouble, but it's not an emergency. But so let me tell you about whistle. I, I think it would have come in handy. There were these two young kids. Um, well, yeah, I, I don't know. They were in their young 20s, a guy and a girl that went out for a day hike in Trabuco Canyon. This was in uh, 2013. Well, um, anyway, they got lost on their day hike. Uh, it is a wilderness area, even though there's urban areas all around it, it is a big uh, wilderness area. And they got found four days later, severely dehydrated. And, uh, and they're lucky to be alive. But sh had they had a whistle on them, they could have been found a lot sooner. So I just want to mention that. Um, you should have a flashlight um, if you get lost. Also, if something doesn't go as planned, you end up being out there overnight. This does happen uh, to people, just like the two kids I'm talking about. Then uh, having a flashlight will be useful um, to prevent yourself from tripping, falling, or whatever. Although you shouldn't be really walking far, you should be finding shelter if that's the case. But uh, we do do evening and night hikes too sometimes, and I'll show you a video later where you'll, where you'll see something like that, but that is an important item to have. Also rain gear and extra clothing. Um, the weather can change very rapidly in the mountains and in the deserts, as you, uh, I'm sure you've seen before, thunderstorms can appear almost out of nowhere and drop rain, so it's good to have rain gear with you. In the extra coat clothing, as it says right here, this guy, um, hike leader, carries extra clothing that helps him to survive the night. Maybe not enjoy it, but to survive it. So also you should have extra food and water. It can make the difference between surviving or not when things go wrong. But also I always carry a little extra food and extra water. I usually carry more water than I think I'll need because sometimes and if I come back with water, that's great but I've also had to use water to help another hiker in distress 
The extra water also, if you're out on desert hikes and it gets hot and someone overheats can also be used to cool a person down. And obviously if you end up having to spend the night for whatever reason, because you, uh, they can't come in and, and rescue you during the night, um, then you have also some uh, food and net water for that. You should have waterproof matches and a fire starter. As it says here, we don't build fires on the hikes, but in an emergency we do. And to give you just a little example of that, in 2006, there was a couple from, I believe it was Dallas, that uh, took the tram up to Mount San Jacinto to do a little day hike up there. And um, they got lost. They heard a water rushing up there. This was in early May of 2006. They heard water rushing. They think, oh, there's a waterfall. I'm going to go look for the waterfall. Well, they got way off course out there. That's a huge wilderness area up there on the top of the mountain. And um, they couldn't find their way back. The terrain got really rough and steep. And they kept following. Anyway, they were gone for three nights. And they came upon a camp that they found um, after the three nights of trying to stay warm on those cold nights in May. And in this um, camp, they found matches. Well, they also found a dead body up there that was a person who got lost up there the year before because they got to a dead end canyon where it was just a sheer cliff going down in a waterfall. So uh, anyway, they used the matches that they found that were still good and they started a fire which burned about one or two acres, but that's what got them saved and the remains of the person who was up there the year before um, were obviously given back to um, uh, his family at the time, but that's an emergency and that's what they used it for. Uh, pocket knife, that's handy. Um, that's part of the 10 essentials, just a small Swiss army knife, maybe one of those that has the little things like the little tweezer in there. The tweezer on desert hikes might come in very handy if you happen to bump against some cactus and get cactus needles in you. So <laughs> you might want to keep that in mind, but pocket knife is very useful for all kinds of little emergency things. And a first aid kit is part of the 10 essentials. Um, moleskin is very handy. I know I ended up with a bad blister on a hike and that sure helped me get through the rest of the hike. Uh, sometimes you may not have the best shoes or something or just a, a long hike. Uh, also antibiotic, uh, antiseptic and Band-Aids. Um, Red Cross uh, first aid class um, is useful. You do have to take that to become a hike leader with the Sierra Club. So I've taken the uh, Red Cross first aid and CPR class. However, if you do plan on backpacking, being out in the wilderness, it's probably useful to have a wilderness first aid class too. And then if, uh, last but not least, you should have sun protection, including a hat, sun green, sunscreen and sunglasses. Okay, so now we're gonna explore a little bit. So we're going to go here to the North Lichen Trail in Palm Springs. Now this one, you can do it as an out and back from the trailhead area that's off of Ramon Road. And, um, but we did it as a loop on this particular hike. We started uh, the, at the museum trail behind the Palm Springs Art Museum. And that's a very steep trail going up until you get to the picnic tables. And uh, then you go slightly past the picnic tables, turn left, going down the North Lycan Trail to Ramon Road. And then we went and came on a street back to the art museum. Actually, that street was very nice that we walked back on. I don't remember the name of it, but there are some of those old retro houses there with some beautiful wooden doors with beautiful paintings and stuff on them. So wish I could remember the name of that street. Anyway. This was after a very wet winter. You can see I've never seen these desert hills this green before. And uh, I've spent a lot of time out there in the desert. And here are some of my hikers you see on there uh, heading up the trail. And this is a view from the North Lycan Trail over Palm Springs. Uh, you can see the windmills in the back and on the upper left-hand side, the snow-capped San Bernardino Mountains. Looking towards the south, you can see Murray Hill. Um, that's a interesting hike. That one's a little over nine miles, a round trip. It's 2,100 feet of elevation gain. So 
for that one, be sure you check the trail properly because you can take a wrong trail accidentally too and end up in a desert canyon or wash or whatever. And that one needs plenty of water, especially if it's warm. Okay, not too far from there is the Araby Trail in Palm Springs also. Uh, some of you probably have heard about that, um, the house that used to belong to Bob Hope. Well, it's kind of, you can see it in the center there with the round uh, roof. So the trail actually goes around and up past there. So it's looking down on it. The trailhead to that is um, the parking area is very tiny. It doesn't fit very many cars. So if you go on the weekend, you may not be able to find parking there. But however, um, the if you go across the street and you go up the trail that starts um, going along these houses and that's a quiet zone. There are signs there that ask you to please be quiet as you're going past the houses. However, as you keep going, you can see the trail opens up and goes out in open area, the quiet zone is over there. So it goes, uh, continues up. You can see that Bob Hope, Bob Hope house up there on the top, but that's almost a tongue twister. And um, when you get to the top of the trail, the Araby Trail, it does connect with some of the other desert trails in that area. So it connects with uh, the Burns, the Garston, and the Henderson Trails up near the top. And uh, there's, uh, we kind of went to the top and it was a cold and windy day that day and just stayed up there. I had a little, sat down, had a look, had a nutrition break. And that's my, uh, one of my sons contemplating the Mount San Jacinto Peak over there. Anyway, now that we looked at a couple of those, we'll see some more later. Let's talk about desert safety tips and desert survival. So one, you should avoid hiking during the hottest part of the day. Frankly, just don't hike during the summer out in the desert, it's too hot. So, and that's one of the reasons we're doing this particular talk uh, this time of year, because this is one of the best times of the years to go out there in the desert. From now till probably about mid-May, although when we did um, that Murray Hill that one time, uh, I, I've done it a few times, but uh, it was March and it was in the 90s. So you really have to pay attention to the weather. And then a few weeks later, it was down to the 70s. So yeah, you really have to pay attention. Uh, out in the desert, stay hydrated, uh, drink a lot of water. Uh, you can pre-hydrate before uh, going on the hike. You should replenish electrolytes, especially if it's warm and you're sweating a lot. What I like to do is I take the little powdered um, uh, electrolytes and put them in my water. Or also I like to carry uh, salted nuts and, and munch on those. Uh, learn to recognize the signs of heat related illnesses. This is important. Uh, and I'll tell you what, the CDC actually has a good chart. If you look it up on the CDC website on heat related illnesses, they have a whole chart on what to look for for heat rash, sunburn, heat cramps, heat exhaustion, and heat stroke, heat stroke, which is life-threatening, and then what to do. Um, you should be aware of monsoons and flash floods. A lot of the desert areas um, do have monsoon season. And even here in our local um, deserts, uh, a lot of the water, the flash floods come down from the mountains. So if there's a thunderstorm and heavy rain up in in the mountains, it can affect you down in the desert. So just be aware of all of that. You should dress appropriately and pack layers, um, especially if you're there uh, into the evening. If you, um, you know, do get lost and end up spending the night, the desert nights can get very um, cold, especially at this time of the year. So just um, it's best to dress in layers. Uh, watch for wildlife and keep your distance. Um, so never approach wildlife, especially now in the spring, the bighorn sheep are lambing and uh, you just want to stay away from any wildlife, especially one that's protecting young. Also uh, rattlesnakes, there's a lot of rattlesnakes out in the desert. Um, what I usually do, I, I use hiking poles and if I'm stepping over rocky areas, 
uh, where I can't see what's on the other side, where there might be a rattler there, I'll tap the ground or the rock with my hiking pole uh, just to be sure I don't end up stepping into a rattlesnake, which by the way, almost happened once, which is why I watch out. Uh, know your limits and rest often. Use the buddy system. It's always better to hike with someone else. You can watch out for one another and um, you know, watch out to make sure you're not having signs of the heat-related illness. Uh, leave your itinerary with a friend or relative. Uh, that way, if you do uh, get lost or something, they'll know where to look for you or have a good idea. Stock your car with extra supplies. Um, if you've used up all your supplies on your hike, you get back to the car, you're going to be happy you had that stuff there. On the other hand, if you're driving through the desert for quite a ways out in the boonies, which I did once on the backside of the Salton Sea, my goodness, that's a lonely area. I mean, uh, if your car breaks down, at least you have those extra supplies. All right, so hopefully those were some good tips for you. And hey, actually, I got, yes. Hey, it's Julianne. A um, couple of questions um, have popped up on the chat uh, about the tips. Can, can you spend a couple of minutes and talk about what brand of electrolytes you like um, and also talk a little bit about heat stroke? Okay, what brand of what kind of lights? Electrolytes. Oh, um, you know what? I. I don't really, for me personally, I, I don't, there are so many different kinds out there. I don't have any particular brand that I would, you know, am fond of or recommend or something like that. So, I mean, you can just kind of, I think sometimes some stores you can just get individual packages and you can try them out for yourself. Or sometimes if you're at places like Costco and they hand out samples or whatever uh, in, in the little packages or places like that. Um, you, you can try them out and see what, what works best for you. But uh, I know there's little packets from Gatorades. There's even little um, uh, dried coconut water, which is an electrolyte that you can put in your um, drinks, which I've done before too. So I don't know, it's just something you can kind of try on your own. Now, um, well, heat stroke, that's, that's life's threatening. So what you have to do, like I said, uh, you can go to the CDC and, and pull up that chart that they have there on heat related illnesses. It's really great because you have to start recognizing them from the beginning. So um, heat rash is uh, if you start getting uh, little blisters, also um, if your skin gets red and stuff like that, sunburn. But the where we start getting into the danger zone is when you have uh, start really getting uh, red and have heavy sweating, when you start having muscle pain and nausea, because that's, that's a sign already that you're uh, exerting yourself too much and you haven't been drinking enough uh, and you're getting too warm. And so when you start getting into the heavy sweating, the clammy skin, the, um, the pulse of not being right, uh, being too tired or weak, dizziness, headaches, and stuff like that, then you're moving into the danger zone. Heat stroke, your body temperature is getting uh, too high. Uh, you might be losing consciousness, and that's, that's a very serious issue. So that you need, uh, that's a medical emergency. So hopefully it doesn't get to that, and you recognize the signs as you go, so you can, um, you know, prevent yourself from getting to that danger zone. Um, and the other question, uh, and I think Marianne may be able to chime in too. Uh, tell us your, your, uh, your flashlight and rattlesnake story. Oh, <laughs> all right. Well, uh, yeah, we, we used to do a, a lot of night hikes and, um, uh, Anyway, we were doing a local night hike and um, there was a lot of coming down the trail at night. I mean, it was dark and um, coming down a, a hillside. And so as I'm coming down, I have my flashlight out and I'm panning side to side as I'm walking down from, from the brush on the side of the trail to the brush on the other side of the trail, just panning back and forth. And as I'm panning back and forth, it 
which was better to me than just, you know, one little beam in front of me or something. And I had a, it's kind of a puny flashlight. I mean, it was, so anyway, um, there was a coiled up rattler on the side of the trail, nice and coiled uh, right under the brush. And so I warned the people behind me and, uh, you know, we kind of made a little safe, uh, um, you know, kind of waited for it to move off a little and then quickly went around. But uh, yeah, so they're nice and coiled even at night. <laughs> All right, Any, anything else? Julianne, is there anything else or shall I continue? I think we're okay uh, for now. All right, okay. Then let's get, uh, we're, right now we're gonna watch a little, um, it's a six minute video um, that I found. I, I looked at several and I kind of liked this one. It had some great little tips. This lady actually lives in Utah, in the Utah desert, but uh, she has some good little tips. So can everyone see the video? Can everyone see the video? We're seeing a dark screen. You're seeing a dark screen. Yeah, we're not seeing a video yet. No video visible. Okay. Are you seeing it now? No. Nope. Okay. I am here camping and hiking. We can hear it. You can hear it, but you can't see it, huh? Hmm. Are you not hearing playing. screen? Okay, well, it says. Share screen. Um, Who's sharing? Oh. Yeah. Okay, see, I guess I do have to. You may have to, you may have to, to go off of it and then share the video on yeah, its own. I think so. Okay, yeah. do you see it now? No. No, not yet. You have to go, or go off of the, 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 um, PowerPoint, PowerPoint or whatever you're on, okay. and then just go to the video. All right. The wildflowers are out, the cacti are oh. blooming, and it's just such a special time to be here. And so I thought I would share it with you and go over seven tips for desert camping, backpacking, and hiking. Tip number one is don't assume it's going to be hot. So a lot of times when people hear the word desert, they think just incredibly hot, sun beating down on you. And yes, there is a lot of sun in the desert, but it's not always hot. For example, when the sun goes down, since there isn't a lot of humidity, in the air, it gets very cold at night sometimes. So I'll just tell you a quick story. I invited my brother out to come on a backpacking trip in Southern Utah. I live in Utah. He had never been and I told him, okay, pack warm clothes. Like I sent him a whole packing list and he shows up with no jacket. He said he heard the word desert and just like tuned everything I was saying out and just brought like hot weather clothing and he was freezing. Learn from his mistake and make sure that you really don't assume it's going to be hot and bring some of those layers for when the sun goes down or if it happens to be a cloudy day. Tip number two is have a change of clothes. So if you are out hiking all day long in the desert, it's possible that you're gonna get pretty sweaty and your shirt might get really wet with sweat. And so if clouds do roll in or if the sun goes down, it's really nice to be able to take that wet piece of clothing off and put something dry on because without the sun, it can get pretty cold as we just talked about. So bring a change of clothes in case you really get sweaty out on the trails. Tip number three is to stay hydrated. I know this is pretty obvious, but water sources can be very limited in the desert. So if you're going backpacking, you need to make sure that there is a water source on your route or pack in enough water for your entire trip. Keep in mind that in the desert, a lot of water sources are not year round. And so this is information that you really wanna try and seek out and understand before you go on your hike. For example, Nick and I went to Canyonlands National Park last fall and we knew that the water sources were really limited there. We tried to get some information on it and basically everything that we got was, I don't know, there might be, there might not be. So we ended up both packing in a ton ton of extra water that would sustain us throughout our entire trip in case we couldn't find any. Turns out there was a storm that came through a couple days earlier and we were able to find water in some puddles and it was totally fine. We had plenty of water. But the point here is 
Hydration is important and water sources are not necessarily year round here in the desert. So just do your research and kind of know what you're getting into before you get miles out on the trail. Tip number four kind of unfolds from number three and that is to be prepared to filter some dirty water. Sometimes the water source that you do find in the desert is a stagnant puddle of water. You have to be prepared to filter from that and also know how to back flush your filter. So filters get clogged a lot easier when you're kind of filtering from that more like gritty type of water. So just know how to back flush it in case it does get clogged because again if you mostly go to Alpine lakes or nice streams of water it might not get clogged as quickly and so just be prepared that you might actually be filtering from some gross water tip number five is to bring sun protection so shade is very limited in the desert and you definitely want to protect yourself from sunburn when you're out in the Sun all day long it's so exhausting and so draining and you definitely just don't want to get sunburned I have the type of skin that gets sunburned pretty easily and so I have a long sleeve hiking shirt shirt that pretty much makes an appearance in almost every single video. It's that blue one that I'm always wearing. It has SPF protection and I absolutely love it. I'll link to it below. Highly recommend it. But I also bring sunscreen with me. I bring SPF chapstick. You can bring a hat. You just really want to be protected and have some options in your pack to keep protecting yourself throughout the day as you're hiking or just spending a lot of time in the sun. Tip number six is to really pay attention to the weather before your trip. Storms can move in quickly here in the desert just like they do in the mountains and high winds can create low visibility by kicking up a whole bunch of sand and then of course thunderstorms have flash flood potentials and lightning and often when you're hiking the biggest mistake women can make when it comes to reducing wrinkles is not understanding where they come from. Whoa, sorry You're about that. In very exposed areas in the desert. And so you really just want to pay attention to the weather and take those forecasts seriously when you're hiking. And lastly, tip number seven is to keep an eye out for harmful creatures and plants that are in the desert. For example, there are a lot of cacti here in the desert and thorny bushes. So you just want to watch where you're stepping. And then there are a lot of animals that live in this land that can be harmful to you. So the point of me saying this is really so that you can go and familiarize yourself with the animals that are native to the area that you're going to be hiking so that you know how to avoid them and keep yourself safe on the trails. I wish I could just give one of those saguaro cacti like a huge hug because I think they are so cool but you can't because they're full of thorns. <laughs> All right so there we go seven tips for hiking backpacking or camp. All right everybody I think I'm gonna have to go back and reshare my um, screen. This Let's see. Okay. So the video's off. Yeah, I'm, all right. Do you see the PowerPoint now? Yes, we do. Okay, yeah. I just don't know how to get this bar out of the middle though. Are you seeing the, the mm -hmm. bar in the middle? Yeah, try your next slide and see if it's gone. It might okay. just be from that video. Nope. Yeah, still there. Yeah, I don't know how that toolbar got down there. Yeah, you might be able to just grab it and move it up. It, disapp it disappeared through part of the film. Yeah. Yeah. I got it. All right. Okay. So now we're going to explore a few more hikes. Uh, does everybody see Big Morongo Canyon Preserve in front of you? Uh huh. Yeah. Wonderful. Now, isn't that beautiful? That's a great riparian area there. It's off the 62 that's on the way to uh, Yucca Valley Joshua Tree off the 10 freeway. Uh, you turn on the 62 heading north. And um, anyway, I just, this is just a beautiful um, place to go. They have a lot of different trails there. Um, this snow-capped San Jacinto, Mount San Jacinto in front of us is from the Yucca Ridge Trail there at the Big Morongo Canyon Preserve. And uh, this is along the Canyon Trail. Um, we've got some apricot mallow and uh, uh, we've got the, some cactus blooming there. It's just, there's just awesome uh, cacti and uh, wildflowers there in the spring after a nice rain. And uh, if we have any herpetologists who can identify uh, this lovely lizard, that would be great <laughs> because I don't know what it is, but it sure did like to watch us as we were going through there. I think it could be a coach whip. 
that long tail. Not a coach whip, but a, a whip tail, I think they're called. Anyway, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, he's cute. Um, all right, another one of my favorite ones out there is uh, Whitewater Preserve. Uh, and here you see some of my hikers out there on uh, Whitewater Preserve. Um, this is the visitor center. This used to be a trout farm and it was bought up by the Wildlands Conservancy. And uh, right now, oh, this is one thing I have to mention. So if you're interested in going on any of these hikes uh, areas that I'm showing you or any others, um, of course, right now during these COVID times, uh, you're gonna need to double check and see what's actually open or not. Um, Whitewater was closed down, the parking lot was closed down uh, and everything because of the COVID and they just recently reopened it again. The visitor center is not open. So you can, can't go in there, but they do have restrooms open in the picnic area, which was right behind me from where I'm taking this picture, um, just so you know. But still, you should double uh, check uh, before you plan to go on any of these, just to make sure uh, what's open and what isn't. Um, here's a big group of hikers uh, we had on a chilly day. Uh, this is December of 2019. Um, Heading out. Uh, this is near the beginning of the trail near the visitor center. Uh, as you're heading out this way, it's about a half a mile until it intersects with the PCT that goes through there. And uh, here's this picture was not from December. This was taken in, uh, I think, in April, May or June of uh, another year. And this was a PCT hiker that was, uh, they like to stop there near Red Dome, that is, and uh, cool themselves in the river. Um, next door to Whitewater is the Mission Creek Preserve, uh, which is kind of belongs to Desert Hot Springs, but it's next door and you can hike actually from one um, to the other. You have to hike over a ridge. So if you hike from um, Whitewater to Mission Creek, you can hike to the stone houses and back. It is a, a about a 13 mile round trip to do that. So uh, you could you can also do it as a shuttle hike, which we've done before in the past, park one car at the Mission Creek and go back to Whitewater and park the other car there and then just hike one way. Um, anyway, there we are crossing the river. This is the near the beginning where the gate is if you drive up to the Mission Creek Preserve and uh, park there by the gate. Um, I will be showing a little four minute video, uh, just a, a few minutes that will explain a little more about this or show a little more and explain. This is one of my favorites, La Quinta Cove to Lake Cahuilla in La Quinta. And there you see some more of my hikers getting ready to head out. Uh, this is near the beginning of the hike. You can see all those uh, desert mountains there, a big Ocotillo plant in the middle that was just barely starting to bloom. They have big, beautiful red blooms there uh, when they're in full bloom. Uh, this is on part of the trail. It kind of goes up and down along the wash and up along the hills and down again. So this is almost at Lake Gawea. Uh, you can see there's a golf course down there. That's one of the reasons the trail uh, winds up along the hills, to keep us away from the golfers so we're not disturbing them. Um, and uh, there's a good opportunity to see bighorn sheep there. I've seen bighorn sheep on every time I've been there so far, except one time I, I didn't spot any, actually just one way up high on, the, on, a, on a hill far away, but we usually see lots. There's me pointing to a bunch of bighorn sheep behind me that are very camouflaged in that brown rocky terrain. And there were seven back there on the hill and uh, later they crossed over the wash and uh, went to go eat that luscious golf course grass. <laughs> this is the, where the trail enters the Lake Cahuilla Recreation Area, uh, which is run by Riverside County Parks. Uh, there is now an Iron Ranger to uh, pay a day use fee, which is, I, I looked it up now at $6 dollars per person for day use. Um, that's fairly new. That didn't used to be there. So that's, I think they just put that up in the last year uh, or so. So you're supposed to pay a $6 fee to go in there. 
Um, but down there by the lake, there's a bunch, there's restrooms and picnic tables and everything. So it's a nice uh, place to take a little rest, nutrition break uh, before heading back. Um, then there's Thousand Palms Oasis, which is part of the Coachella Valley Preserve. A very um, beautiful area out there in the desert. There are several oases that are part of the Coachella Valley Preserve, and this is just one of them. Here we're walking on a protective boardwalk through, through it. And that day we went, uh, we had a rare sighting of a long-eared owl. Uh, you can kind of see it there right in the middle of the screen. Um, when you continue back behind Thousand Palms Oasis, there's a loop trail that goes around called Moon Country Trail. And uh, some of that landscape out there makes you feel like you're out on the moonscape. Uh, anyway, it goes back, goes up a little hill and then back down into the wash and back around to the um, oasis. Uh, so now I'm going to show you the uh, little four minute video of Palm Springs hikes. So let's hope this works a little better than the other one did. Okay. Um, so now. Are you guys are not seeing the screen yet, are you? Not for, yet. Not for the video? Not okay. yet. All right. So. Um, Oh, there we go. I guess I had to press escape to get to that video. All right. Okay. Here. Are you seeing it now? Yep. All right. Here we go. No. Wind in your hair, blue sky above, dust at your feet. Finding the way on unpaved earth is a pastime proven to pacify mind, body, and soul. And in the Coachella Valley, areas, the hiking portions of the famed Pacific Crest Trail, to the granite spires of Mount San Jacinto State Park, and the waterfalls and canopy of palms inside the Indian Canyons, Greater Palm Springs is the epicenter of outdoor adventure. All you need is a trail and a plan. Dreaming of a secret oasis? Vargas Palms at the westernmost tip of Palm Springs is perhaps as close as you can get. The trail, a true hidden gem, runs along Snow Creek as it snakes its way through a boulder-strewn canyon at the base of Mount San Jacinto. Keep a watch for wildlife as you hike through a variety of habitats from wash to dunes to canyon and eventually into the shade of a native palm oasis. Enjoy the silence from this nature hideaway and also those sweeping views of the real world down below. The Living Desert Wilderness Trail is the perfect well-rounded trek. Start off by saying good morning to the menagerie at the Living Desert Zoo and Gardens. The trailhead is inside the conservation park. The path will then lead you through varied terrain from sand to boulders. One minute you're in the middle of Palm Desert and the next, seemingly all signs of civilization disappear. Although it might feel remote, the breathless climb will eventually reveal endless Coachella Valley views. Stay up top, catch your breath, and see what you can spot. Perhaps your next adventure. Dusty Roads, the poster child of adventure. This one leads through Desert Hot Springs to the Mission Creek Preserve. This spot has a history. In the 1930s, it was the T Cross K Guest Ranch. These stone structures were once bungalows that could be rented for five bucks a night. Today, the preserve is part of the Sand to Snow Monument, which stretches from the dry earth of the Colorado and Mojave deserts to the snowy top of Mount San Gorgonio. 
A perennial stream fed by snow melt is a picturesque perk of the 4,700-acre preserve. The lush wetlands, a somewhat surprising sight, wet the whistles of a myriad desert critters, from bears to bighorn. Let your senses take the lead on this nighttime adventure. With a full moon overhead, we join conservation group Friends of the Desert Mountains and a lot of their friends to experience a portion of the Cove to Lake Trail in La Quinta. Our path, illuminated by Mother Nature, is surrounded by craggy Santa Rosa Mountains. We're keeping a close watch for desert creatures tonight. We could possibly see an owl, a coyote, even maybe a scorpion. That said, most of them are lunar phobic, which means they're typically less active when the moon is full. As the moonlight cascades down the hillside, we see the shadows change and cast a whole new light on the desert landscape. A view of Lake Kawea is the payoff. And in the distance, twinkling lights and the bustle of the city, giving one the feeling of being part of nature, but not too far away from reality. In and around the nine cities of Greater Palm Springs, there are hundreds more trails to explore and thousands of miles to trek. The rules on these unpaved roads are few, but their importance far reaching. Know your path, wander with purpose, breathe deeply, respect the land. All right, everybody, did you enjoy that video? Good. Yes. Came yeah, I, I, I like that one a lot. Mm -hmm. Yes. So, right and um, all right, and you see my PowerPoint again, correct? Yes. Good. <laughs> yes. Hey, we're getting this. All right. So, a couple of questions before we, we move sure. on. Sure. Um, What's the best way to access uh, the trailhead there at Whitewater and then in La Quinta? What would you recommend to people how to, how to drive there? Okay, uh, Whitewater, uh, you actually head towards Palm Springs. And uh, once you pass that big uh, rest area on the right-hand side before you get to Palm Springs, it's actually the next exit after that, which is Whitewater Canyon Road. And when you get off the exit, you make a left turn. And, um, and then you'll see there's uh, on the north side of the um, freeway overpass that crosses the um, Whitewater River there, um, there's a, um, a company there that sells stones and stuff like that. Um, well, when you turn left and you head that direction, don't go into the company. There's a road that goes to the left then and you keep going. It's a small, uh, narrow road that goes into Whitewater Canyon where the visitor center and the parking area is. Um, so, and it's, it's free to go there to Whitewater Canyon. The Wildlands Conservancy is a great organization that allows us to go to their, um, a wilderness areas for free. So I think that's great. And uh, it's a great organization to support if you're if you're inclined to do that. Uh, La Quinta Cove to Lake Kawea. Um, that's uh, anyway, that hike is a 6.5 mile out and back with 550 feet of elevation gain. And the way to get there, um, you can kind of look on the map for La Quinta Cove. There is a big parking area there when you get there. There's actually two parking areas. One's a smaller one and one's a bigger one. It's better to just park in the bigger one. But uh, if, if there's room in the smaller one, that's great. But to get there, you take the 10 freeway and exit at Washington. Um, turn right on Eisenhower, right on Avenida Bermudas, and it turns into Calle Tecate. Um, so also you can camp at the, at the campground at the Lake Gawea. 
also, and you can do the hike backwards from there if you want to. The camping, uh, they do have hookups and everything there. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm a tent camper, but it's uh, between $25 and $45 a night. I looked up and like I said, the day use fee is currently $6. So hopefully that helps you. Right on, right on. Anything else? I think that's it for now. Oh, somebody, um, maybe at the end of the talk, wanted the URLs of the, the two videos. So yeah, they're good videos. So uh, maybe after we're done. Uh, the yeah, video. I don't know, because I mean, I actually, in the, the slide that you see, oh, I, you know, I, I put in the, the link to it, but somehow, you know, I can't seem to get it to work the way I want it to work. But I don't know if if somebody then uh, if you're recording this, does it also going to include my PowerPoint or not? I'm not sure. Everything, you know, everything is included in the recording, so maybe that's the best way for for um, for Cynthia to access it. Um, anyway, uh, right. so we can we can see the the slide, so we're good. Yeah, but for like this video that I just showed from the Palm Springs area, if you um, do a search on YouTube and just put in wander list, um, it'll come up in one of the first few uh, videos that come up if you put in wander list. That's the lady who, who does these, um, that, that video that I just, the last one we just showed. Okay. So um, anyway. All right, and now it doesn't seem to want to move to my next slide, why not? There we go, there we go. All right, so now we're actually at the end of my presentation. So what I'm gonna leave you with here is a couple of pictures of the high desert. Uh, now, most of the hikes that I've shown are the low desert, and that's where I do most of my hiking in the winter, although I do go up uh, to the high desert on occasion, and I hike with the lovely people that I know up there from the um, Mojave group, and this is a PCT section that was up there. Uh, it's kind of behind Lake Silverwood in the high desert area, and uh, oops. And up there also, here's a beautiful picture of a desert prickly poppy we saw up there. So hopefully maybe you might see that on a future um, informative presentation. Um, I can't guarantee that, but <laughs> I'm hoping you might. But uh, so there we go. So thank you, enjoy the desert, stay safe and well hydrated. And also that the little video I wanna tell you that um, hike that they showed that was out uh, the very first one in the video with the Vargas um, Palm Oasis by Snow Creek. Uh, I have not been to that one myself and there was a big fire there last year so that may not be accessible at this time or not due to that fire so just want to warn you about that. Like I said um, you're gonna have to research everything if you want to go in there to make sure what's open and what's accessible or not. All right. So any other questions? I think we're good for now. Um, but let me just say this uh, before uh, your, your final uh, comments. Um, we will have uh, our next trail talk next uh, month, March 17th. It's always on the third Wednesday of the month uh, at 7 p.m. And that one will be with Brian Elliott, who's another one of our colleagues, an outings leader and Audubon board member, and his talk will be on birding, one, birding in the IE. So that should be fun too. Christina, you have been fabulous. I have so enjoyed this and so many people have been saying the same in the, in the chat. So thank you for all of your, your wealth of experience. Um, makes me want to. You're, you're welcome. Video. You're welcome. I hope I didn't mess up with the showing the video. <laughs> that, that was a little sore point, but. Oh, it, it worked fine. It was but, great. And we've so, got a question here from Danya. All right. I think. Not a question. Um, I just wanted to ask. Um, oh, I'll just say hi, everyone. My name is Danya. Um, my pronouns are they, she. 
I'm the digital and social media assistant for the chapter. Um, I basically just wanted to ask if everyone was okay with me taking a screenshot of the Zoom and um, I'm just gonna post it like on the chapter socials as a like, oh, you know, like this was a presentation type of thing. Um, <laughs> yeah, so if everyone's okay with that. Um, yeah, I think like, it's great. Yeah, okay, cool. Um, if you wanna be in the picture, go ahead and like turn your camera on. If you don't, turn it off. Um, I'll do like a little like one, two, three and then take it. Um, All right, Thanks, okay, Sammy. everybody, camera's on. <laughs> okay. Um, one, two, three. Cool. Thank right you. And so I'd, like to, I'd like to say something, Julianne, if you have a second. You bet. Okay. So um, we did have one question about, do we have a schedule of these hikes? And Sierra Club National has paused, continued our pause on any <clears throat> in-person events through July 4th. So all of the local outings have been canceled. We can't have any in-person meetings and even all the national outings through July 4th have been canceled. Um, I put our um, website outings address in the chat and you can go there after July 4th or even before and uh, see if there's any outings, but that's where our normal outing schedule would be. There's a, in another year, we, we would see outings almost every other day or on every weekend. But right now we're just not able to do anything at, uh, for the safety of our volunteer leaders and our participants. So I wanna thank you all for coming. And um, another great desert hiking location is Joshua Tree National Park. Um, <clears throat> we have a number of outing leaders that lead hikes there. Uh, we typically have a an, um, camping trip there in the spring in other years. And we also have a camping trip in the Mojave Preserve in other years. So just keep your eye on our website and our newsletters, our Facebook page, and um, keep up to date with what's going on with our, our chapter outings. And thank you. All right, bye everybody. Yeah. Thanks for joining us. Christina, I missed your talk. <laughs> <laughs> what happened, John? <laughs> oh, wait. Steve Farrell figured it out. Oh, good. What, what happened was somehow the underlying link mm -hmm. underneath the URL that I pasted into the reminder thing right. to a Zoom event hosted by you, not by me. I know, and I don't know how that happened. I don't know how it happened, but he was able to analyze the link because the, what you saw was the correct link, but mm -hmm. underneath it, it was different. Wow. If you're cool. doing hypertext markup language, you can create a, a, a link like this uh -huh. here, the words click here, but underneath right. it is actual URL. Oh. In this case, the, what showed in the email I sent out as a reminder was the overlay and underneath was a different link that didn't take you, didn't take you to the one that you were supposed to go to. It took you uh -oh. to your Zoom account, not mine. Yeah. Well, so I wonder if there were people that wanted to watch this and join in who weren't able to either, since there yeah. was. Stop the recording. By the way. Why don't you stop the recording? Yes. <laughs> and and save it to the cloud, and then uh, I can send out an email to everybody uh, with the link.